Hi everybody, I'm back with a restoration, this time a Sol uh, processor technology, Sol terminal computer from 1976, the world's very first true home computer with an integrated keyboard and producing a composite signal that you could connect to your, to your TV. To open it up, there are two thumb screws at the back, but these ones were very rusty, so I, I used the screwdriver to take them out. I'll lubricate them so later when the computer is at the museum, um, then people can just open um, the case with, uh, with their thumbs, with their fingers, without the screwdriver. You have to remove the fuse holder as well, and then you can just lift the back part um, of the case. And the front part also you can just lift at this point because it's interlocked uh, with the back. Uh, this computer was shipped from, from the US, so the two memory expansion cards were dislodged, but um, there was no further physical damage uh, to the cards, which is a good thing. It uses 2102 memories, single bit uh, memories. And that metal bar that you see there I think I'm going to point to it now to highlight that it was assembled in 1977, even though this is a computer designed in 76. There you go, 77. That metal bar is actually a heatsink for the linear regulator that goes on the expansion cards. The power supply provides a non-regulated signal to the backplane for the expansion cards and a regulated signal for the motherboard uh, underneath. So now with the back part of the case lifted, we can also just lift the front part as well and expose the keyboard assembly. And the keyboard is kept in place with uh, four screws, self-tapping screws. So you just remove the four of them and then you make sure to disconnect that uh, flat cable, which I'm doing now. And, and then the keyboard assembly is freed and you can, uh, you can just put it aside in order to expose the rest of the motherboard underneath and to the left you see the power supply circuit. This will need a lot of restoration, it uses capacitive foam pads and they are surely dissolved by now. Now look at these two chips, look at the package. It's, it's a fantastic, fantastic ceramic package and you can see the metal lines from the pins going into the die in the center. And you can see that they get thinner very slowly and progressively to avoid a, a large impedance mismatch on the way. Very nice. They don't do things like this anymore. Gold plated and ceramic and all that. This is fantastic. Now, uh, the composite signal is, is transmitted via UHF cable and a PL259 connector that you see there. And by removing it, I expose the CPU, which is an Intel 8080, also in a gold-plated ceramic package. Amazingly enough, there was corrosion um, in these pins, um, even though it's gold-plated, so go figure. But it, it, it looks gorgeous. That's the so-called personality card, which has a ROM plus some auxiliary circuitry with whatever you know, firmware you, you, you need. There are several options for personality cards. This is the simplest one, has only one ROM built into it. So at this point, we can uh, disconnect the power supply from the motherboard, which I'm doing now. And there is a separate uh, uh, harness for the, um, the, the backplane connector for the expansion cards. I'm disconnecting that one now. So the power supply now is totally disconnected and I want to disconnect the two large capacitors. And the reason for that is I want to test them to see if I can reform them because this is supposed to be a minimal intervention restoration. So I want to replace as few parts as possible. So I'm testing for ESR and I get Look at that, 0 0.03 ohms. And the capacitance, about 22 millifarads. It's, it's almost the 20, 27, I think. So it's a little bit lower, but it's okay. And the ESR is also okay. So we will reform uh, that capacitor. And I will keep it unless I get a lot of rippling uh, uh, on the power supply, but I'll test that at the end. In principle, I'll keep it. And I definitely want to keep this one as well because it's very large and there is nothing I can buy today in, th in this form, where, and this, this large, everything is smaller today. So I really want to keep this one, so let's test it off circuit in an ESR of 0 0.02, uh, which is okay, it shouldn't be more, I think, than 0 0.05 for a capacitor this large. 
but uh, the ESR means the electrolyte, it didn't dry up completely, it's still fresh. So I'm going to reform it and that's what you see me now. I will link a video, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I'll link to a video in the description of this video um, with a tutorial I created about reforming capacitors. What it is, why it's important, what is the problem that it tries to solve. And the way to go about it is to apply voltage to the capacitor with the current limited, in this case at uh, 5 milliamps, uh, and you apply uh, voltage to it one volt at a time until you reach the nominal voltage. In this case, it's 15 volts. So I started with one volt, waited for it to charge and the current go to, to, to go to zero. Then I went to two volts, wait for it to charge and the current to go to zero. Then I go to three volts, <laughs> wait for it to charge and the current to go to zero and so on. And the idea is that we will be reconstituting the oxide layer inside the capacitor, which after so many years of not being uh, used is definitely cracked. So if you apply the full nominal voltage at once, there will be an inrush of current going through the cracks, DC going through the cracks, and it will shatter the oxide layer. And at the end, you will not have a capacitor. Even if it doesn't pop, it will not work properly as a capacitor anymore. So that's why it's important to reform it. I am at 14 volts now. Notice that I already reached 14 volts and there is still three milliamps DC going across the capacitor. This is proof that this capacitor needed to be reformed. This, this, this means that there is leakage, but it's controlled leakage now. Look, it's going down, it went down to two milliamps. As this leakage goes across the cracked oxide layer, it heals the oxide, it reconstitutes the oxide. And at some point, uh, the current will go down to zero, so the oxide will be reconstituted for 14 volts. And then we apply 15 volts and wait for the whole thing again. And then when at the nominal voltage, 15 volts in this case, the current goes to zero after, after the capacitor is fully charged, then we know that the oxide has healed and now we can apply nominal voltage to it. It's no problem. It's not going to shatter the oxide. It's not going to blow the capacitor anymore. There we go. We are at zero. Only now I go to 15 and it takes quite a while again for it to charge and then for the current to go down to zero, but I'm speeding it up now. Uh, or am I? No, I'm not speeding it up. I'm <laughs> putting you through the entire process. Um, and you see that it charges slowly because I limited the current to max five milliamps. It's, it's, it's draining three milliamps now. And it's, it's very important to limit the current. Otherwise, there will be this inrush and you will shatter the oxide because the oxide is cracked. When current goes through it, it just shatters it. So it's charging slowly because of the current limitation. And you will see that once it finally gets to 15, the current will not drop to zero immediately, which is what would happen if the capacitor was perfectly in order. Uh, it would take a while for the current to drop to zero because the oxide needs to heal. And only at that point, the capacitor will be in order again. And then we can test it again. And you will see that there is a small uh, variation. The, the performance improves a little bit, but most importantly, it's safe to use now. So we achieved 15 and now I'm speeding it up. You see the current goes down quite slowly. Finally, the capacitor is now reformed. Uh, there is a, a discharge resistor connected to it. According to the color code, it's supposed to be a 39 ohm resistor, five amps, I think, or at least two amps. All the resistors are very large. Um, so I will use my multimeter and check for the resistance to make sure it's still okay. It has a, a gold bar for accuracy, so it should be 1% accurate. We should get really 39 something. 40 ohms and then there is of course the resistance of the leads which i think is 0.2 or 0.3 ohms so yeah this is pretty close to 39 i think it goes down to 39.8 minus 3 39 and a half it's supposed to be 39 so this is good we test for the capacitance and the esr um, again and the esr is 0 0.04 below 0 0.05 it's okay um, and the capacitance it, it registers a little bit higher now, almost 52 uh, millifarads. Uh, it's supposed to be a 55 millifarad capacitor, so it lost a little bit of capacitance but, capacitance, but it's still good. Now I'm going through the entire process again for the other large capacitor that I want to keep and not replace. This one is easier to replace, but again, this is a minimal intervention restoration, so I'll try to keep it um, as well. It's reformed. 
So let's test it again. I think it's supposed to be 27 millifarad. It will go, it will register at 22. It, lost, it loses a little bit of capacitance. Uh, sorry for the glare. You can't quite see it, but the DSR is pretty low. <laughs> uh, I test it a few times just to get a statistical average. DSR, I think it's 0 0.01. That's pretty good. So now I uh, take three screws out and uh, remove the back part of the power supply because I need access to those two larger orange capacitors on the board. Um, I need to measure them off circuit uh, and if, if it measures okay I need to uh, reform them uh, as well. So I need to access the PCB of the power supply. I, I vacuum clean a little bit of all the dust that is in there so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. Uh, there is a transistor there that has a heat sink, but the, the thermal compound has dried completely, as you can see. So it's not doing anything anymore. I will clean this and replace and put fresh thermal compound there. Uh, I'm trying now to, to free the, the PCB off the chassis. It's connected to the chassis. There's a lot of uh, heat compound, thermal compound there as well, um, because uh, that that black bar, metal bar there, is basically the heatsink for the three pass transistors that you see connected to it. And that heatsink is supposed to connect to the chassis, and then the entire chassis becomes a heatsink. Uh, but you have to have fresh and good um, thermal compound there for, for thermal conductivity. For now, I'm just uh, cleaning out the old one. And I am uh, taking out the two orange capacitors. I already took one out. I didn't show you. Uh, it's the same thing <laughs> that you're seeing right now. Uh, I'm using the screwdriver as a lever to free capacitor. There we go. Now both of them are free. They can, I can measure them. I think, let's see, 25 volts and 20, 2500 microfarad, I think. And uh, they are okay. They are, they, they, they are actually in excellent state. When you see um, my reforming process, you will see that the current drops to zero very quickly after I reach the voltage I set, which means that there is very little DC current leaking through the plates, even after all these years. This is a pretty good capacitor, uh, but I go through the entire process of reforming uh, them. There are two of them, I reform them both anyway. I test them again after reforming and the results a little bit better, especially the first test. Um, um, my test a couple more times, but the ESR is pretty low and the capacitance registered is still close enough to, to, to the nominal capacitance that uh, this should be okay. Again, uh, at the end, uh, when I turn the computer on and if I see too much ripple uh, in the power rails, um, I, I, I may add or replace a capacitor or two. We'll see. I hope not. I'm cleaning it a little bit more because uh, that's my chance uh, to do it. Remove all the dust now that uh, the board is disconnected from the chassis. I clean some of the flux, old flux that was there as well with IPA and some ESD safe uh, uh, um, tissues. I take the opportunity to offline test all the semiconductors with my multimeter in diode mode. All of them test okay. It's not a guarantee that they will be working, but insofar as I can test offline, uh, they all test okay. There doesn't seem to be any open juncture, uh, junction there. I'm putting fresh uh, a thermal compound on that little heat sink and I apply it back to the transistor. So now everything should be okay on the thermal side and it's time to put the two capacitors um, back in. It's easier said than done, so I'm, <laughs> I'm cutting a little bit of the footage not to show you the entire struggle. <laughs> um, it's not that bad. So I'm, I'm tacking the capacitors now, adding some flux, and now I'm soldering them permanently and cleaning the flux with IPA and an ESD safe uh, tissue. Now that's a new thermal compound for the connection between the, the heatsink strip and the chassis. So the entire chassis will work as a heat sink now. I have to line them up carefully right now and put three screws um, back in. And now just cleaning it up and the excess 
thermal compound that you know, always gets into other things and just clean it up. And uh, here's the final result. Those are the th uh, there is a, um, a bridge rectifier there and two pass transistors connected to that heat sink. You can see the fresh, gray, new thermal compound there, also on that little transistor with the radio uh, heat sink. Uh, everything's clean. I only need to put the very large capacitor uh, back in place in there, but everything checks out. Uh, and of course, of course, the proof of the pudding is when we turn on the whole system <laughs> towards the end but insofar as I can measure things now everything seems to check out okay I can't test that chip for instance without turning the system on uh, but uh, yeah fingers crossed I, I, I don't know the result as I'm editing this video I don't know the, what will come all right so time to close um, um, the PSU now I'm just putting that back assembly uh, in place. I will not screw it yet. I have to put the large capacitor back in. I just want to put it in place so I know where everything goes. There comes the large capacitor and its bleed uh, resistor of 39 ohms. Uh, connecting it back, I will use some uh, deoxid uh, on, the, on the screws to, to make sure that the connection is clean. There's no oxidation there. And I can close now the PSU uh, sub-assembly. So this is it for this first episode. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time with the next part of this restoration. <laughs>